Turn in God's word to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. We're talking about Christ's law regarding truth and justice. Truth and justice. And this passage is a little bit maybe sleepy for you. If you just read through God's word and you're like, ah, oh, man, I'm reading through Matthew 5 today, my time with the Lord. And man, this is like two sections that I don't think I really need to think about. Well, I think you might be in for a surprise like I was. Um, because the point of the passage today is this. You are to speak truth simply and live life graciously. You are to speak truth simply and live life graciously. That's the point of the passage today. And by the way, in case you're wondering, it's impossible for you to achieve. I guarantee you that Jesus is driving you to a place where he's calling you somewhere in obedience that you can't go. And we'll figure out the reason why next Sunday. But for this Sunday, we're going to figure out how we can be faithful to what Christ is calling us to. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, let's go. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil or the evil one. Anything more than this is satanic. What? Wow. That's a little strong. This concern that Jesus has for telling the truth. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Speak truth simply. Live life graciously. This is God's word to you this morning. Actually, this is the word of Christ to you this morning. I was meeting with someone on Friday, and I, I said, you know, <clears throat> what would you want to hear Jesus say to you right now about this situation? Like, plant him right there on my couch in my office. What would you want Jesus to say? What do you think Jesus might say to you in your condition well, you don't need to plant him on the couch. You don't need him to be here in this chair. He's speaking to you right now. What he wants you to know for this week until next Sunday. Speak the truth and live graciously. Now, we want to dive into more about what that means. And to do so, we're going to see Jesus giving us the law of him, the king. The law of the king. In Latin, that's called lex rex. Lex, law, rex, king, the law of the king. This is what Jesus is doing here. The king is giving you his law. It's not out of concert with the law of God and the Pentateuch and the first five books of your Bible, the books of Moses. It's actually showing you or filling up God's law in the Pentateuch concerning telling the truth. And you're like, well, that's weird. Why did you put filling up in quotes? And why do you keep talking about filling up stuff? Well, look in your Bibles, back in chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them, but to what? Kind of quiet and slow. I didn't come to abolish them, but I came to? Thank you. There you go. Better. Yeah, he came to fill it up. And in doing so, he wants to plant us in the Ten Commandments. Now, look at verse 33. It was also said, excuse me, you, again you've heard it said that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. You need to know that those two statements from the law are built upon the foundation of the Ten Commandments. The Ninth Commandment is the foundation of this section concerning oaths. The Ninth uh, Commandment is what? You shall not bear 
False witness. Yeah, you shall not bear false witness. And that ninth commandment of the 10th commandments is the foundation for all the other laws in the law about telling the truth. Such as these two laws that Jesus quotes in verse 33. You shall not swear falsely is drawn from the law and you shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. Both of those are an expansion of the ninth commandment. So the ninth commandment is the foundation here. And second of all, the ninth commandment is what's being expanded upon later in the law. And you have examples of it in verse 33. Is everybody following? Who's not following? If you're not following now, you're in deep trouble because we're going deeper, okay? So look alive, stay alert. I told the first service they might need some coffee because I'm taking you into a place where I'm like, oh boy, this could get boring really fast, okay? But it's because of me, not because of the Bible. Okay, so let's go. No, number three. Now, listen, based on that, later Jewish religious leaders would take laws concerning oaths, swearing to people that you're going to do something, truth-telling, basically, and they would add codes to try to safeguard the law. So they would write down these long legal law codes that were like commentaries on the law, the Bible, to try to explain how to avoid not keeping these laws in the Bible. They were like official commentaries on the Bible, on God's law, okay? So later Jewish oath codes were, I think, I think, to give them the best benefit of the doubt, were trying to safeguard the keeping of the law, but what they ended up doing was clouding the truth, not clarifying the truth. Let me explain what I mean. Verse 34, when Jesus says this, um, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, and then verse 35, or by the earth. You're looking at that going like... Well, this is strange to me. This section's kind of strange. Like, what is Jesus doing here by saying you can't swear by heaven or by earth? Well, for as strange as it sounds, back then it was not at all strange. What Jesus is talking about here, and what he's camping on here in verses 34 and following, is born out of a, a, an engagement with the scribes and the Pharisees that he was going to launch into. Because the scribes and the Pharisees, man, they put enormous weight on God's people about what it meant for them to tell the truth. And what Jesus was fighting against here is the enormous weight of the scribes and Pharisees who taught the people that you could promise someone something and swear by heaven and earth and you wouldn't be lying if you broke your word as long as you swore by heaven and earth. Okay, so some of you are like, I don't, so, okay, okay, so listen, now I'm taking you to the deep end, okay? You've been like paddling around with little floaties in the shallow end, okay? Now I'm taking the floaties off, and I'm going to dump you in the deep end, and here we go by quoting something called the Mishnah, okay? The Mishnah is Jewish commentary on the law. It was a binding commentary from rabbis back in Jesus' time on how to keep the law. All right, look at verse 34 again. Don't take an oath, either by heaven or by earth. Okay, now look up at the screen. This is the Mishnah officially commenting on how to keep verse 33. The one who says, I swear to you, these are liable to judgment if you don't keep your word. Okay, but, but, the one who says, I swear to you, by heaven and earth, well, these are exempt from judgment if I don't keep my word. But, third bullet point, the one who says, I swear to you by the name of the Lord, or I swear to you by Yahweh, or I swear to you by other name for God, well, those are liable to be condemned in court. You are liable for judgment. You have to keep your word if you swear by the Lord. Look at verse 33. What's the law they're trying to keep? You shall perform to who? Oh, guys, keep it moving. Come on. You shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. See, that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to get you to acknowledge that you've got to keep your word if you swear by the Lord. But not if you swear by heaven or earth. 
So what they were doing is, they were, they were looking at verse 33, the law, and they were going, well, it only says to the Lord, so if I swear by something else, then I'm good. It's conditional truth-telling. And hopefully, by the way, hopefully you, if I say something to you like, I swear I'm going to pay that bill next Tuesday. I swear by heaven I'm going to pay that bill next Tuesday. And if you don't know the fine print, then you might be duped by my truth-telling. I can get away with it. I don't have to keep it. I know the technicalities of the law. But maybe you don't. And if you bite, I got you. Is this starting to sound maybe like it could come into the current climate today? And what about by Jerusalem? See that in verse 35? By Jerusalem? You want some more, who wants some more Mishnah fun? Anybody? Okay, okay, more Mishnah fun. There's like maybe, there's actually a fair amount of you. The rest of you, I, I believe, okay? So look at um, this other tractate in the Mishnah about Jerusalem. He who says, I shall not eat unconsecrated produce with you or I shall not eat unclean food with you, is bound to keep his word. You got to keep your word if you say that, okay? But if you say, may it be to me, now look, I'm just putting in other stuff there. It, just look at the blue in the bullet, okay? Because Second bullet, because that's the important part. I'm just giving you the other stuff to help you realize how granular and ridiculous this is. But just look at the second bullet point. If he says, may it be to me like Jerusalem, if this doesn't come to pass, you know, like, I swear by Jerusalem that I'm going to pay my bills next month. May it be to me like Jerusalem is destroyed if I don't pay you back. Okay, that kind of stuff. Well, you're bound. You're bound to keep it because you reference Jerusalem. Oh, oh, wait, unless you believe Rabbi Judah. Look at the third bullet point. But Rabbi Judah says, he who says like Jerusalem has said nothing. Well, uh, can you clarify that? I mean, I read commentaries on the commentary on the law on this, and people are like, yeah, it depends basically on which rabbi you want to believe. Now, <laughs> if you grew up in other religions, this kind of like legalistic stuff is what drives people crazy. Or they love crazy because you can be abused by this very easily. If I come to you and I say, I swear by Jerusalem, I will sign up to serve in day camp tomorrow. And you're Kelly Alexander, you're going like, which rabbi are you reading? <laughs> because you don't know. I could be going, I could be playing you either way. Listen to me. I could be playing you with the truth either way. Bingo. That's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing with life. I will take the truth and I'll play you with it. <laughs> Is that what the law was meant to do? I mean, seriously... <laughs> The silliness just continues in verse 36. I won't even take time to get into the Mishnah on verse 36, swearing an oath by your head. It basically means swearing an oath on your life, okay? I swear on my life or the relative. I swear on my mother's grave, you know, all kind of stuff. You bring the grave in, you know, that kind of stuff. All kinds of nuanced oath making, all kinds of swearing back then was meant to make truth telling, listen, conditioned upon one's knowledge of legal code. It was, let me say it differently. And, th and then you would abuse the truth to your own advantage. Or let me say it like this. Truth-telling became conditioned upon technicality. And whoever was better at technicality could lie with the truth. I've sat in counseling offices where people will say that they're speaking the truth And they're lying by telling the truth. It is remarkable how this happens today. Contrast all of that shading, clouding, nuancing, technicalities, 
all that kind of gradation. Like, I can swear by heaven and earth or by Jerusalem or by my head, and that's all different grades of conditioning. But I better not swear by the Lord unless I really mean it. All that kind of conditioning of the truth. Jesus is saying that all must be put away in the lives of my disciples. God, in his law, always intended for verse 33 to simply mean speak what you mean and mean what you say. Just speak truth. And if this doesn't hit you hard, it's maybe because you haven't been in a hard conversation recently where someone is bending the truth to their advantage and they hope you don't catch them. Or maybe you do. Maybe you're living your life right now bending the truth with your spouse. Hoping they don't call out your technicality. Oh, these little verses here in verses 33 through 36 are sleepy, aren't they? Until you stop and meditate on them. And it's just so simple, isn't it? I mean, the, the principle is so simple in verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. So listen, as long as it's necessary for you to qualify or intensify your truth-telling with things like, I swear that didn't happen. Or, you know, like you're, like someone says sometimes, like, I promise you I didn't do that. And by the way, parents, is this, any of this ringing a bell? Isn't this what kids do really well? Ah, uh -huh. dad, I promise I didn't hit my brother. And he's got like a bruise, like, you know, and the son's holding a bat, you know, or whatever. Kids, you don't do that. I know you don't do that. But the idea being that we, we just want to stop. Just clear and simple statements of truth are what Christ wants from people who belong to his kingdom. So don't ever say, I swear to God that I'm going to do this. Don't ever say that. Usually those kinds of statements are made in haste without thinking about wisdom, and they're usually born out of anger, being foolish. Stop saying things like that. Just say, Lord willing, I'm going to do this. Or I really would want to do this. I'd really want to pay my bills next week, and I'm working on it. So please check back in with me. Like just simple statements of truth. And then keep your word. Let your yes be yes. And you don't need to say, I swear to you, I'm never going to do that again. Don't, don't say that kind of stuff. Just say, I, I, I don't want to do that again. I'm not going to do that again by God's grace. Let your no be no. Um, one last thing about this. Should Christians not take any oath? I mean, look at verse 34. Actually, I want to I help relieve some tension that you're going to feel in this section, which is this. Jesus is not talking about legal oaths. He's talking about personal relationships. You should not need to say to your wife, I swear to you, I didn't look at anything on my phone. You should not need to say that to your wife. Just simple statements of truth. But what about in a court of law? Can you take an oath? There are some Christians who would say on the basis of verse 34 that they can't take an oath in a court of law. Oh, bad, bad interpretation. Jesus is talking about personal relationships here, not about legal contexts. Otherwise, the statement, you shall not bear a false witness, would not bear up if you couldn't take an oath promising that you won't in a court of law. So Jesus isn't talking about legal matters. By the way, he's also not denying wedding vows. <laughs> I had some dude one time, can I call him a doofus? I had a doofus one time say, well, can I not make a wedding vow? I, like, Guys, that's a legal issue. It's a civil matter in that moment. So make your vow to your bride, man. Come on. Don't play games with that kind of stuff. Jesus isn't condemning every kind of vow. He's teaching us that vows in personal relationships should not be needed in life. Why? Because people can believe what you say as soon as you say it. 
Some of you probably need to talk to your parents about this because you've been shading the truth. Go talk to them. Some of you need to go talk to your spouse because you've been kind of clouding the truth. Go talk to them. Some of you probably need to go talk to a teacher or maybe somebody else needs to go talk to a child. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything more than that? Look at the rest of the verse in verse 36. Is evil. It comes from the evil one. It's the beginnings of using the truth to lie. And that's what Satan loves. When you use the truth to lie. It's the best kind of lie is the one that uses the truth. So Jesus is filling up the law concerning the truth. But then he's also going to move to the next section here to fill up the law concerning justice. Justice. And this is this section here in verses 38 through 42 is often called the lex talionis, the law lex of talionis, which sounds like what? Retaliation. That's where we get the word retaliation from the Latin. Lex talionis. What did that law mean to them? Well, by the way, this law in verse 38, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, is mentioned three times in the law, specifically. In each occurrence, the law is about the exercise of justice in a court of law. It's a principle of restitution legally. It was meant to recover losses up to the level of damage that was done to protect people from overpunishing other people. Like, for example, in some countries today, you steal something and they chop your hand off. That is a violation of this law. If you steal something according to law, you give it back with some interest. An eye for an eye, a truth for a truth. The law, the law was meant to regulate punishment, not maximize punishment. Okay? Now, having said that, what did this law mean back then for the people of God and for the Jewish folks at the time. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees had taken this legal principle of lex talionis in the court, and they had made it a personal principle for all of life's relationships. And now, if you touch me, I'm going to smoke you. It's biblical. It's in the law. The Pharisees had turned a legal statute in the law into a practice of personal vendettas. Uh tit-for-tat kind of arrangement that marks so much of our politics today. Christ will have none of that in his kingdom. Christ instead fulfills the law regarding justice, listen carefully, by diffusing personal vendettas and by diffusing a desire for revenge in relationships when we are injured in some way. In what ways? I'm glad you asked. Jesus lays down the heart of God's word in verse 38 with examples in verses 39 through 42, which I will call the law of non-retaliation. Lex law, non-talionis, non-retaliation. What does that mean for us? Oh man, I'm so glad you asked. Because in verses 38, 39 through 42, Jesus is going to explain what it means to live life in relationships with other people personally, and not ever take vengeance. You ready? Number one, if you're provoked by someone, turn the other cheek. The first example of what it means to live life justly as a member of Christ's kingdom, in relationships, not in a court of law, there's an exercise of justice that's to be meted out in a court of law, but personally, if you're provoked, turn the other cheek. Now, in this passage, look at verse 39. Um, Do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other, other also. Now, I can... Derek, can you come up here for a second? So Derek's going to slap me in the face, okay? He's not going to slap me in the face, but he's... Well, hopefully he doesn't. Derek could do a lot worse to me, by the way, if he wanted to. Um... This is your moment. <laughs> We're not going to grapple, though. Okay, so 
De are you right-handed? Yeah. Okay, so Derek's right-handed, I'm left. So, okay, if you were to slap me on the right cheek, what might that look like for you being right-handed? This is my right cheek. Boom, it's a backhand, yeah. Now, what you just did instinctively is actually what Jesus is referring to. In a right-handed world back then, a right cheek slap, look at your Bibles. A slap on the right cheek would have been a backhanded slap, which in a Middle Eastern context back then, and even today, is hugely insulting. Now, Derek, could you do damage to my face if you slap me? Sure. <laughs> he could. Yeah, he really could. This was not planned, by the way. Did you know you were coming up here? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he's also security, so he's helpful to have come up here, because if he slaps me, then other security will bum rush him. But they have to get through, though, first. So that, that kind of slap would hurt coming from Derek to me, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't like crush me, right? The real offense back then was the dishonor that Derek caused me when he slapped me. It's a huge slap to my honor in front of other people to be backhanded like this, okay? Derek, thank you. You want to give it up for Derek here? That's good. Thank you for not really slapping me. But the idea is it's more a matter of honor than physical injury, okay? So loss of honor back then required financial remuneration from Derek to me. I could get money from him for the dishonor he gave me. But Jesus is telling us, his disciples back then and today, to forego any financial benefit which might be accrued to us if we're even legally entitled to the insult of our honor. To accept the insult without responding. And even more than that, to turn the other cheek. Derek, thank you. Give me another. Why? Why? Why would Jesus command this? Do you remember what I prayed in Isaiah 50? That Jesus gave his cheek to the one who would slap it, who would pull his beard out? That's exactly what's in mind here. Jesus is actually saying, I'm commanding you to do what I'm going to perform for you in the future at the cross. People are going to slap me. People are going to pull my beard out. People are going to mock and hit me in the face. Isaiah chapter 50 says that God's servant, the Messiah, will give his back to the one who strikes him and his cheek to the one who slaps him. Jesus is asking you to do what he himself will do to perfection. You, in this, are to follow his lead. You are Christ-like when you do not retaliate. Christ didn't retaliate on his way to the cross for you. Now again, legal considerations are not in view here. This is personal relationships. Let's move on to number two. If you're poor, give this shirt off your back. If you're poor, give this shirt off your back. Now, I don't know why the NASB chose, if you're using that, in verse 40, to translate tunic as shirt and cloak as coat. That seems very Western to me. I think the ESV has a better translation there with tunic and cloak, because that's actually what they called it. One's tunic back then was your, basically like your undergarment. It was what you wore against your skin. You wore a loincloth, something like underwear, and then you wore a long garment up underneath that was thinner. That was your tunic. And then if it was cold, you'd wear a longer, thicker robe called your cloak. And a poor person would use their cloak and use it as a blanket at night to sleep with. So in other words, Jesus is saying here, when someone takes your basic necessities, your tunic, offer him your most basic necessity as well, your cloak. The principle here is this. What your opponent could not have had a rightful claim to you offer to him freely. This scenario has to do with a poor person who had nothing left to give to anybody but their own coat. Jesus is aiming at poor people with this principle of non-retaliation. And the poor person is basically to give the last of his things away. Who's sufficient to this task? in this room. Who's sufficient to that task? Who could really practice that? He will. 
Just read the rest of Matthew. He's not asking you to do anything more than he has done at the cross. The poor disciples must have been stunned by this, this second example of Lex non talionis. And then number three, a third example, if you're pressed, go the extra mile. If you're pressed, go the extra mile. Verse 41, this third illustration would have touched a nerve for the common Israelite because, here's the reason why, because this particular verse, verse 41, refers to a Roman soldier's authority to enlist a civilian at a moment's notice without warning and without pay and force them into forced labor on a task they assign. We have an example of this in the New Testament when, surprise, at the cross, Jesus falls down unable to carry his cross, and who is conscripted, forced, to carry the cross for Jesus on the spot by a Roman soldier, Simon of Cyrene. He's forced to pick up Jesus' cross and carry it after Jesus can no longer carry it. That is an example, the only New Testament example of conscripted labor. It was despicable in practice to the average Israelite. This was an offensive, oppressive, practice deeply resented by the Jews, and especially by the Jewish population party called the Zealots. The Jewish political party of the Zealots hated Roman rule, hated Roman oppression, and they were the ones who would have been blown away by this third example of how to not retaliate in relationship. When a Roman soldier commands you to carry his stuff for one mile, You are not to rage against that. You're to carry it. Oh, and when you're done, carry it another mile. This is Lex Rex, the law of the king. It's an astonishing renouncement of one's rights in order to, verse 44, love your, who? Not neighbor, enemy. Welcome to the kingdom of Christ. And then last of all, if you're petitioned, give alms for the poor. You remember that old phrase, alms for the poor? You know that kind of phrase? That's what's in view here. Mm. This fourth one would have crushed another population in Israel's society, another mm, party in Israel called the Hellenists. The Hellenists were Jewish ethnically, but they were Greco-Roman culturally and politically. They were enriched by the business dealings that they would do with the Greeks and the Romans, the Romans in particular. So they liked Roman occupation. They were Jewish by ethnicity, but they liked Roman authority because they got rich off of it. These were maybe you could say the enriched set who didn't want to bother with the poor plebes, plebeians, filthy people down below, dragging the rest of us down problems in our society. Jesus has a word for them too. Can I just say this? Have you noticed in Jesus' preaching that he will bring conviction to every political party in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Israel? Nobody emerges without this distinct thought. No matter where you land in society, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Bingo. If you can listen to Jesus' ministry for too long and come out unscathed, you're not listening hard enough.
And so here the focus shifts not to the hated authority, but to the unknown poor that you want to pass by and leave behind. And so this third, this fourth example would have hit the high culture Hellenist because here's a call to love the stranger. Here's a call to not pass by the poor. Who are the poor in our area today? I'm sorry. I mean, we, we've politicized it big time, but who are the poor in our area? The homeless. You just hear the word and you instantly want to like jump to something in your mind politically, some solution that you have that you think is right and we're not doing or we are doing and you're all in favor of. Can I just encourage you, stop thinking legally, stop thinking about all that stuff and just hear Jesus say this to you. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so I just, I think I've been, I sat on this for a long time, and I think what I want to do is just make it achievable. This is impossible, but I want to help make it achievable as you wrestle with how impossible this is. I've learned from Hope 680, a ministry that Toby Weiser Church started, that there is a way to be prepared to give to the one who begs from you at a moment's notice, unplanned, not passing by them and hoping they don't see you and you don't see them, but like giving to them. He calls it a blessing bag. Are you familiar with this? So there might be solutions for the homeless problem and whatever, but that's not what Jesus is calling you to here in verse 42. He's just calling you to give to the one who begs from you. And so, so I, I, I texted Toby and I asked about ways to apply this verse to life with today's poor around us. And um, he, he said this, yeah, people should totally have blessing bags in their car to give to those who beg. So here's a blessing bag. This is what he gives out. He keeps it in his car, two or three of them. And then when he drives by, if, if that person's close enough to where it's like, oh, you know, like that close, then he wants to have something in his car to give to them. So, you know, if the person's like around the corner, down the street, on the other street corner, you don't have to like drive through the intersection, crash into three cars to give a blessing bag out. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But if you're near enough by to where there's actually a, a, an ask, then here's a gift. This has a gospel tract in it. What is the gospel? So it's gospel proclaiming. And as you give it to them, you want to tell them, I'm giving this to you uh, because I love you in Christ. It also includes... Um, uh, tuna salad, some protein. Um, that would be tough for me to eat, but that's for them. A Capri Sun, two granola bars, and then some socks because feet get cold even in the summertime. And then some hygiene products and some feminine hygiene products as well. Some deodorant, some, um, some toothpaste and a toothbrush. And, and you're not giving them money. So what, we, what Toby said is we encourage people to have these in their car to hand out. I would discourage people from handing out money because they're going to spend that on undesirable things. And as far as other ways to encourage people to give to those you ask, I would encourage people to give specifically in terms of food. So if someone's begging you and saying, please give me money for something to eat, I would encourage purchasing food for them and handing it to them directly. He also says another option in that regard is to have a Burger King gift card to hand to the person, like a little $5 card. They can get a burger and some fries. They can, they can eat. They can't use that for something nefarious unless they really work hard at it. He would say it's a hard, it's a much better option than handing out cash, which is almost certainly going to be used to purchase something undesirable. One additional idea, he says, for people who work in San Francisco or in Oakland, where there's a lot of homeless, and you pass by them every day, he, Toby would actually take a pair of socks and wrap the socks around two granola bars and a gospel tract, and then put a rubber band around it. He'd throw it in his briefcase. And when he would walk by someone, he'd just pull this out of his briefcase and give it to the homeless person that they interact with and give them a quick gospel proclamation to turn to Christ. It's easier to carry, he says, and to hand out than an entire blessing bag. However, blessing bags are better and they're great to keep in the car. So this seems like something that might be easy to, to do. For some of you, it's going to be hugely challenging to do because you live your life ignoring the poor. You just want them to go away. Uh, can 
Can I just encourage you to just make progress? Take a small step in this direction. Give to the one who begs from you for something. And that's the law of the king. I, I need to close because we're needing to be done. And in fact, um, Dan's going to come out, we're going to sing. But can I just show you that, um, can you just skip ahead to the other slides real quickly? That this is the heart of the law. Jesus has been teaching you the heart of the law, filling up the law and the prophets. Do you see how? Go to B. The heart of the sixth commandment is what he taught you in Matthew 5, 21 through 26. The heart of the seventh and the tenth commandments. The heart of the ninth commandment. The heart of the eighth commandment. The heart of them all, love your neighbor. And even your enemy. And in so doing, we live life fulfilling in our own imperfect way, not just the law on the surface, but the law at the heart, our heart. Jesus truly is the king of the law, showing us God's intention for his word. From this ancient word comes all of what we need for life and godliness from the words of Christ himself. We can't obey it on our own, but he's given us the spirit to help us. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had to give attention to the words of Christ, to hear about how it is that you have written your word in such a way that it is without error, it's inspired by your spirit, and how Christ has been pointing us back to the heart of your word all along. We are so prone to miss that, Lord, and I pray that you'd help us to hear all of the word of Christ as for us today to encourage us and for us today to equip us as well. So send this away from here, God, I pray, strengthened and encouraged in Christ and in your word, we ask in his name. Amen.